Snafu is a podcast that contains adult themes and language. Listener discretion is advised. Hey guys, welcome to Snap Food, where the situation's normal, all fucked up. This is the podcast where we tell you stories of true crime, true mystery, and the truly fucked up shit that happens every single day that we all seem to have just forgotten about. So we decided that we wanted to remind you. I'm your host, Shannon, and I want to thank you all for popping in and giving Snap Food a listen. Uh, we're on the tail end of our big move, so that means just one more episode with no Corey. And I'm really sorry about that, guys. It's just basically really starting to turn into the Shannon show over here, isn't it? But I, as I've been promising, and I really do mean it, Corey is going to be back, and that's going to start next week. And, uh, you know, we have a little something like surprise for you guys, a story that Corey's really going to enjoy, and uh, we're hoping you guys do too. But until then, you know, at least I've received a few comments that were really wonderful. And I want to thank you guys because so far, I guess some of my solo episodes haven't been half bad. So, yay, I've gotten some nice comments and, you know, I haven't totally, totally pissed anybody off yet. (laughs) And hopefully you guys can hang in there for just one more episode. And that means this time we're going to be getting into what's been happening here all week, which means since I live in South Florida... I've literally been facing down the barrel of a hurricane for the last earlier half of this week. And at this point, you know, I'm sure half our listeners have too. They were either dead earlier this week. They're either doing it right now when you're probably listening or you're in some weird, crazy future space and you have no idea why I bothered doing this at all. (laughs) But um, yeah, basically, I kind of thought I could delve a little bit into the hurricane since I am a true Floridian unicorn. I've actually been born here, lived through a couple of hurricanes down here, and it's just it never changes. Like you get really, really used to it. But the overall feeling and panic and stress that comes with a hurricane that never goes away. And so, you know, I'll talk about it a little bit because basically You end up running around like a chicken with your head cut off because you always have some kind of preparations from last year, last time. But, you know, since then, you know, hey, I needed a plastic plate or I needed some battery. Like you've dug into your stuff. And then by the time the hurricane's coming, all you can think about is getting water, which everyone else is doing. And yet it's like you think about your every single day and we never drink water. Like maybe you do, but not enough that you need like 16 gallons of water in your house. (laughs) And like, and that wouldn't be a problem. You're not doing it for drinking water. You're basically doing it because you're afraid the power is going to go out and your toilet's not going to work or you won't be able to wash your dishes or yourself. But for instance, uh, the hurricane just missed. And so now I have a really, really like big initiative to start a diet of of drinking a lot of water because we just have so much now. And that's just the thing. Like, okay, so am I going overboard? Did I just get too much stuff? You know, you're running around and you're spending way too much money, more money than you know you really have to be spending. And it's not even on fun stuff. It's, again, batteries and water. And then, you know, you turn around and there's nothing else to do once the hurricane is coming, right? Like you've done all the prepping you can, the storm's almost here, and all you can do is wait and see. And you're sitting there and like while you've already thought, oh my God, I did too much work and this thing's probably going to miss us or it's not even half as bad as they say, you're also sitting there looking at the bag of junk food that you bought you know, for the next two weeks and you literally have been stress eating. So you have like a day and a half's worth of, you know, food. And you literally start realizing like all that prep that you thought was too much. Like you're now thinking, oh my God, was that too little? And I literally have enough to make it like a couple days. This is supposed to be like a week's worth of stuff. It's just an overall, I don't know, freak out. And it's stuff that we do even to ourselves. But then on top of it, it's like what the 24 seven news channel, the, the, weather guy telling you this is the hurricane to beat all hurricanes and oh dear god like run for the hills and then everyone does and not only does it miss like the place it was supposed to go to but now it's head straight for the hills everyone left for it's like going to atlanta i basically yeah do i sound a little house crazy i might have been stuck in the house a little too long 
But, you know, those are all things that definitely worry people as they deal with these hurricanes. And they're understandable fears, you know, survival, facing the unknown. A lot of people just fear the storm itself. I mean, it's a gigantic natural occurrence that we can do nothing about but prepare to hunker down, essentially. Hope that we've built buildings well enough to withstand a hurricane. Like... That's not even to going to say, like, what happens when it floods, like it had in Katrina or Texas or the Bahamas. Like, literally, there's an ocean where your yard was, and you didn't live near the ocean. You know what I mean? Like, th- there's a lot of reasons to fear the natural and and everything that comes with the hurricane. But that kind of being said, there's something that we don't often worry about during a hurricane that we really should start questioning. And that is... What about those people that you've brought into your home when you're deciding to hunker down? Do you ever really consider who they are or how well you really know them? And a lot of people are probably thinking, like, no, that's unnecessary. If I'm hunkering down for a hurricane, if I'm blocking up all my windows and I've bought supplies, I'm not going to invite people that I feel uncomfortable with. Like, I'm only going to invite friends and family. But the thing is, is like even those people, like the reality of life is that we never really know people as well as we think we do. And so besides all the terrible things that could happen during a hurricane, just because there's a literal monster wind outside, uh, you never really know if there's a monster that you've literally just trapped inside with you. And that kind of brings us to our story today, which I'm going to be talking about uh, the hurricane in 2004, Hurricane Ivan. I actually posted a sneak picture online thinking like, hey, here's our teaser and uh, didn't think about it because I found the picture of Ivan as it sat over Alabama. (laughs) And evidently some of you guys have feelings online. Um, I wasn't trying to be politically like appropriate or inappropriate I like literally just found a picture of Ivan so that's what we're talking about 2004 we had a hurricane that kept jumping from category three to five to two but you know it definitely it swung around into the Caribbean it was hitting a category five as it hit the western tip of Cuba and a lot of Floridians, even though the fact that this this hurricane was swooping out to the left and hitting for the Gulf Coast, at the time, as it was hitting Cuba, it really did look like it might give a direct hit throughout the Florida Keys. And if you guys have listened to me at all, you know that I love South Florida. I love the Florida Keys. But if you know anything about the Keys, they're little rocky islands. And whenever a hurricane comes through, you know, they can get decimated and... There aren't a lot of choices for people who are living down there. You really either, you know, board up and you get out of town or you risk it all and try and hang in there. And I've heard personal stories that are just like the floods have gone so high and people's, you know, entire living rooms were damaged. And that's just, you know, if you're lucky, it's just uh, you never know what's going to hit down there. So in this particular storm in 2004... A lot of people in the Lower Keys were doing just that. They were boarding up and they were making plans. And this kind of brings us to the story of Carl Charlie Brandt and his wife, Terry. So they happened to be living on Big Pine Key at this time. And they were fortunate enough to have more family throughout Florida. And so as the storm looked like it might be hitting them, Charlie set about boarding up the house. But Terry received a phone call from her niece, who happened to live in South Seminole County up near Orlando. And this was Michelle Jones. And Michelle was a very pretty 37-year-old television executive. She worked for the Gulf Channel out there in Orlando. And she was doing really well for herself and in her job. You know, she... She's beautiful, she's young, she has a gorgeous house, pool, jacuzzi, and, you know, she's done well enough in her life that she is able to open up this great house to her family because she's been watching the storm. She's very close to her Aunt Terry, and she worried about them having to suffer through what might at the time look like a Category 5 she offered up her house, said, hey, you know what? Like, come on, come up here and visit with me and we'll hang out. 
and Charlie and Terry jumped at the opportunity to take her up on it. Now, first of all, the couple were very close to Michelle in the first place. Aunt Terry, who was only eight years older than Michelle, had this really close relationship. They talked a lot on the phone, and in fact, uh, her and Charlie often came up to visit Michelle at least once or twice a year. On top of that, Michelle lives right outside of Orlando, which is basically a tourist capital of the world. It's got Disney World, it's got Universal Studios, it's got SeaWorld, and people come all year round from all over the world just to see this place. So, in fact, most times when I see a, I hear of a hurricane coming through, you often hear someone mentioned, hey, screw the windows, like maybe we should all just go up to Disney. And it's like literally like people think that hopefully if a storm might possibly hit Disney World, then there will be less tourists and it will be actually manageable to walk through. There are some real weird Disney files down here who take every chance to go up there that they can, but that's going to be like a whole other story. So The point was, is that despite the fact that even on a good day, driving from Big Pine Key up to Orlando would normally take more than six hours, and so this drive probably took them at least eight, the couple still figured it would be better to get out of Dodge than just to stay in and try and, like, live through this storm. Like, let's just, you know, let's go take a trip. Let's see our niece and have a good time. And like I said, this hadn't been the first time that they came up to visit, so since they came pretty regularly at this point, the eccentric aunt and uncle from the Keys had already met a lot of Michelle's friends. And so when Michelle figured out that these guys were going to be coming up for a weekend, now in early September, well, there was nothing better than to have a pool party. So by the time uh, Terry and Charlie even showed up to the house, Michelle was already on the phone 20 minutes later calling up her friends and asking them where they were. They were all, you know, Terry and Charlie are here. Let's have that pool party, you guys. Come on, let's hang out. So when friends described these eccentric aunt and uncle, you know, Terry, Terry was really Teresa. She just went by Terry and she was definitely a free spirit, kind of had a gypsy vibe to her. She was considered fun loving and happy go lucky and came to Charlie who like we, his name is Carl, but he's always been known by Charlie And a lot of people just kind of remembered him as, you know, quiet. He'd hang off in the corner and and more or less watch the party than interact with the party. But, you know, he was a nice guy who never lost his temper and was just so sweet that he wouldn't even kill bugs, which down here in South Florida is basically unheard of. Uh, Essentially, they're everywhere and, and trying to get inside at all times. Like, no, you can't risk not getting rid of bugs. But the point is, is Charlie wouldn't even do that. And when it came to the two of them together, a lot of people saw them more like a dream couple. Not that, you know, they were exceptionally good looking, but the fact that they seemed to love each other and that they never argued and that they had this thing where they liked to do like little things for each other that would make the other person happy. And they have friends who said, you know, I've thought if I could have a relationship like Terry and Charlie or even half the relationship that they have, then I would be lucky. You know, that's something to strive for, uh, seeing people you think are really in love and wanting that. Um, That's kind of how Terry and Charlie kind of came off. They've been married for 17 years since 1985, and people didn't see a crack in anything. They seemed like regular happy folk. But whereas a lot of people saw just this weird, funny, eccentric couple You know, there were some, like, weird, odd points that stuck out. And for me, the biggest one would be the one between Charlie and Michelle. So, like I said, Michelle's not that much younger than her Aunt Terry. But she's young. She's, like, a good eight years difference. And she is very pretty. But this is still Terry's niece. And for me, the weird thing is, is that Charlie never, ever referred to Michelle by her her actual name. He didn't call her Michelle. Instead, he often called her Victoria's Secret. And it was like a little inside joke because he found her so attractive. She was a like a Victoria's Secret model. Victoria's Secret. So clever, right? And... And I can break this down in my own opinion, which is just like, okay, it's just a guy who thinks he's being clever and she's very pretty. And so it's it's a compliment and and it's just his personal nickname. 
And obviously, if he's been doing this for a long time, then, like, she's cool with it, right? But when you really think about it, like, how many other people would have really put up with that? Like, there's calling someone, like, I don't know. It's even weird to really think about it. Like, you don't refer to your friends by their looks solely, uh, even if they are pretty. Like, you can say, hey, hey, pretty girl. But, like, you wouldn't, like, always call them that and never say their name. And especially when you're really breaking it down to, like, a Victoria's Secret model. Now, this was a big thing. It was really big. I remember it being big in the early 2000s. You know, I think that there was a lot of this in the 90s. But you're still just referring to a model who walks around in their underwear. You know, this is a, this is your niece. I know she's a grown woman, but it just seems odd that this is what he just consistently wants to talk to her about. But, you know, despite that, she must have been fine. Like, she had this relationship. They came up a lot to visit her. And, you know, but no matter how close the relationship is or how fine you are with people, you know, after a couple of days, guests get tired of you, they get tired of not being in their home, and you get tired of them invading your space. And no matter how this really turns out, you know, the couple had come for the weekend and had been expected to leave by September 13th on Monday. And the fact is, is that they didn't. And it, the timeline gets a little weird. You know, at this point, the storm had passed beyond the Keys. It was swooping up the Gulf and heading towards Louisiana and Alabama. So there was really no reason for the couple to continue to hang out in Orlando, especially as the week progresses. I'm sure, you know, Michelle probably had to get back to work. And they were expected home. Like, Terry had even told friends, like, yep, yep, we'll be driving back on the 13th. But... When the 13th came around, they packed their bags and even put them in the hallway as if they were getting ready to leave out the front door. And then Charlie changed his mind. Charlie said, you know, hey, let's just stay an extra night. And we're never going to know. Like, was it, you know, did he say, hey, I my mean, stomach hurts and I don't want to make a six hour drive? Or did he just say, like, we got on, we're getting out of there too late. I don't want to start driving in the dark. Or did he literally just say, hey, like, this is so fun. I wanted to stay an extra night. Like, hey, would you put up with us? But either way, the couple ends up staying for Monday night. And Charlie offers up to make a nice fish dinner, which is something, you know, he did often in the Keys. But what little we do know about how that night was turning out is from Michelle's friend, Lisa. So evidently, by the time the couple had decided to spend the extra night, they're going to have this dinner. Michelle must have talked to Lisa, called Lisa, and said, hey, you know, since they're staying extra, if you want to come hang out, we're just doing an extra night of hanging out. But by the end of dinner, Michelle ended up calling Lisa back and, you know, kind of said, no, this isn't, it's not a great idea. You know, she admitted, like, they'd all had a little bit of wine to drink. And in fact, Michelle felt like she had drank a little bit too much. And to top it off, like Terry and Charlie were arguing. So really no one was going to be good company. So it was more like, hey, you know, I know I said you should come over, but like eh, probably not tonight, another night, you know. Oh, okay. I'm sleepy. I'm a little tipsy. I'm going to bed. You know, essentially this is how this call played out. So as far as we know, things weren't, yeah, things were turning a little south. Like for some reason, Terry and Charlie were arguing, but then, you know, as far as we know, maybe Michelle was just a little tipsy and she's tired. It was Monday night and she was getting ready to go to bed. But the thing is, is that was really the last time anybody heard from Michelle or Charlie or Terry. It turns out, you know, people were trying to call Terry on Tuesday. I mean, they were expected to drive back on Monday, so she should have been in town. I'm sure her, her friends were trying to catch up with her, but they couldn't reach her. Not only that, but... Michelle's mom, Mary Lou, who lived up in North Carolina, you know, she had a pretty close relationship with her daughter and she knew that her sister was coming into town and, you know, how they often did, probably wanted to gossip and catch up. And so she called her daughter on Monday, but she only got to the voicemail. Well, okay, well, we thought they were leaving Monday, but maybe, heck, maybe they didn't. So then Mary Lou called again on Tuesday and yet again got her daughter's voicemail with no response. And now Mary Lou started to worry. This just, this wasn't like Michelle, you know, she'd at least, you know, probably send a text or say something, hey, I'm sorry, I'm still entertaining, like anything. It was strange that she couldn't even get her on the phone. And by Wednesday, 
Mary Lou had just basically had enough. Um, Mary Lou reached out to one of Michelle's friends, Debbie, and just said, you know, I can't reach my daughter. And, you know, would you please just go check on her? You know, you have the key. I just And I must have been like a neighbor slash friend because Debbie goes to the house but still has Mary Lou on the cell phone. And Debbie heads up to the front door, uses her key on it, and it's not, it's not working. It's so strange. She's knocking. She's getting no response. So, you know, you do what a good neighbor slash friend does, and you're going to wander around the side of the house. You're not just going to leave. Debbie headed over to Michelle's garage and decides to peek in through that because this is one of those garages that has a lot of glass panes in it. So it's easy to look through and see everything inside the garage. What Debbie wasn't expecting to see there was Charlie, who had hung himself from the garage rafters by a bed sheet. Needless to say, everybody already knew something was wrong. Something, something was very desperately wrong and so Debbie called the police and it was really up to the police to find out what horrors recited in Michelle's house after that so as police opened up Michelle's home they found a pristine very feminine house that looked very neat and put in order and you know it it was nice except for the fact that it smelled There was remnants of a fish dinner, and there appeared to be like a lot of wine had been drunk. And to add to that smell, there were bodies. There were two more bodies. So they found Terry in the living room. She was slumped over on the living room couch, and she had been stabbed several times in the chest from a knife that belonged to Michelle's kitchen. Apparently, even though her death was incredibly violent, It didn't seem like there had been a struggle. It seemed like there was no indication that Terry knew that Charlie was going to murder her so violently. It didn't look like she had fought him off, but nothing was out of place. And even though she was stabbed several times, it appears that maybe she at least died quickly. But when it came to Michelle, they happened to find her body in her bedroom And Charlie maybe had been very quick with his wife, Terry, but it turns out Charlie spent hours with Michelle. So Michelle's body was found on her bed and she died from a single stab wound to the chest. But that is not all that Charlie had planned to do there. Charlie removed all of Michelle's bloodstained clothes and he carefully put them into her bathroom sink. He then went back into the bedroom, and with two knives from Michelle's kitchen, he started to mutilate Michelle's body extensively. So he started by decapitating her and placing her head nearby her body while making sure that it faced herself as if to watch whatever he was doing to her. He even went so far as to carefully smooth the hair back from her face. It was as if this was like his prized doll. Like, this is this is psycho serial killer fantasy shit. He wanted Michelle to see what he was doing. And um, from there, he proceeded to cut off her breasts. He ended up removing her left leg. And he also cut open her chest and removed her heart. When I say he did extensive destruction to her body, I mean he really truly was being a monster and according to investigators all of this would have taken hours for him to do and not only would it have taken hours but it definitely did not appear to them as if this had been the first time he had done this or thought about this this was something that looked like it had been well planned out it looked like almost surgical in their words. This didn't look like some guy who lost his mind and suddenly started hacking somebody up. You know, the everything seemed to be precisely as Charlie had wanted it to be. In fact, once he finished desecrating her body, he then went around her room and took all the Victoria's Secret panties and bras that he could find. He cut them in half and then he shred them around the room. Just put them out. Like he was literally leaving this as his sole message. Charlie then took off his bloody clothes and left them in the bedroom. He took a shower. He put on fresh, clean clothes. And then he proceeded to go to the garage and hang himself. No note. No explanation. Just a totally gruesome scene of two family members and a murderer who killed himself. And no reasoning why. 
police were stunned and so were the family of Terry and Michelle. They just couldn't believe that Charlie had snapped and and killed them after 17 years of marriage to Terry, after numerous visits to Michelle. Like, what could have happened that made Charlie just go crazy? They just couldn't believe that this guy would do this. But the thing was, is there were some people who could believe it. And it turned out that Charlie's own family wasn't as in shock or surprise as everyone else happened to be. So just a few brief days after the murder was discovered, relatives from Michelle's family and Terry's family and also from Charlie's family, all these people who were supposed to be in Florida, were supposed to come together for a briefing by police. However, Charlie's older sister, Angela, chose not to attend. She, in fact, came and sat in the police parking lot and then reached out to police officers themselves and expressed that, well, there was really something that they needed to know about her brother. It might clear up a whole lot of questions for them. Angela decided to sit down with the police, and in a taped confession, she gave a very descriptive detail on how her brother Charlie had murdered their mother in January of 1971. So... 1971, Charlie Brandt's family is living in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He's got his parents. He's got his older sister, Angela, who happened to be 15 at the time. Charlie's 13. And they have two younger sisters. And that's not all to the family because they are expanding. Charlie's mom at this point in time had been eight months pregnant. So on this January evening... Angela recalls that around 9 p.m. she was laying on her bed in her bedroom and she was reading. And she knew her parents were in their bedroom, but they happened to be in their bathroom getting ready for bedtime. And Charlie's dad, Herbert, had been shaving in the mirror and Charlie's mom had been in the bathtub and, you know, just just cleaning up, getting ready for nighttime. That's when Angela heard her father calling out, and it was something either to the extent of Charlie don't or Charlie stop, and then she heard a bang. It turned out that Charlie had taken a handgun from his parents' bedroom and then stormed into the bathroom where he shot his father in the back. Charlie then moved beyond his father and then stood over his pregnant mother, who at the time was calling out to Angela to call the police. Charlie then shot her several times before he turned on his older sister. So Angela had heard the screaming, came around the corner to see what they were yelling about, what the noise was, watched her brother murder her mom, and then turn on her and physically attack her. She had no time to turn around and call the cops. You see, Charlie had turned around, saw his sister, and he pointed the gun at her and pulled the trigger. But this time, it didn't fire. And in his rage, he just physically attacked her. And next thing Angela knew, she was in a fight for her life with her brother. And she was scared and confused and did the only thing she could think of at the time. And it worked. She begged Charlie to calm down. She did everything in her power to try and make him stop with her words. She told him that she loved him and it would be okay. And she said that she literally watched this mad glaze in his eyes just so slowly seep out, just disappear. And there was Charlie. You know, he wasn't who he had been. And as soon as he finally stopped fighting her, Angela took her chance and she ran for the door. And Angela took out in January into the neighborhood, into the snow, covered in blood, and ran for her neighbor's door and pounded on it. But as she looked over, Charlie was coming out of their house. So she abandoned the neighbor's home and moved on to the next. So by the time the first neighbor's door opened, Angela wasn't standing there. It was Charlie. And all Charlie did was look up to the 16-year-old neighbor girl that had opened her door. And he said, Sandy, I just shot my mom and dad. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, what, what do you even do? Like, that's that's the quiet little neighbor boy you've known your whole life. And, and he just said, excuse me, what? Yeah. So everyone at this point in time was stunned. Police managed to get called. They got Herbert Brandt, the father, to the hospital. Unfortunately, like we already know, Charlie's and Angela's mother passed away. 
but their father actually lived. And as he sat in the hospital, he admitted to the fact that it had been his son who committed this crime. But in the same breath, he couldn't stop saying, but I don't know why. He did it, but I don't know why. You know, he was just so lost and stunned and confused. So police took Charlie into custody because his father had admitted to the fact that he was guilty. Uh, But the issue is that Charlie's 13. This is 1971, and by law, he can't be held accountable for murder. They cannot put him on trial for murder because he's a minor. And in their views, he can't be held accountable for his actions. However, you know, police are still in the search as to, well, why did he do this? And they're not, they're still not getting any answers. As far as everyone's concerned, neighbors, friends, family members, school, everyone says that Charlie's just a quiet, nice kid, that he's a good student, that he has plenty of friends. He even admits that he loves his family and his family says they love him right back. So all this time, Charlie's never showed signs of, you know, being a little off or having fits of rage. He's never seemed to have any kind of issue creating social friendships. He's not showing any signs of the fact that maybe he has some kind of mental illness other than the fact that he literally snapped one night and murdered his family. He, it wasn't just that he did kill one person. He tried to kill many. So then when police finally turned to Charlie and asked the very question of, hey, why did you do this? The only answer that Charlie gave was, quote, it was like I was sort of programmed to do it. And that was it. So still no answers, no deep seated grudge. No, we had a fight. No, I got grounded like nothing. It's just I felt like I was programmed to do it. And just like in our Brenda story back when we talked about killer kids, this is the early 1970s that has a great stigma on psychological work and punishment for kids, like what's being upheld. We have a 13-year-old. He's a minor. So they do definitely think that there must be something mentally wrong with this kid because so far there's been no other answers nothing wrong in his social life or his family life so like it's got to be his brain right the court at least requires that he undertakes three separate psychological evaluations at this time and yet the professional like psychiatrists that look him over they end up saying that they had a difficult time trying to diagnose any mental illness. And according to psychiatrist Ronald Pinkner, there wasn't anything to diagnose. Like, just because we want to call him crazy because the act that he did was so terrible doesn't mean that he's crazy. He's just a bad person. So... Like we said, Charlie's 13, he's a minor, he can't even be taken to trial for the murder. So all that happens is that a grand jury is convened and they get together and after looking over the psychiatric evaluations, looking over the past and looking over his answer, they have no other option than to say, look, this was really awful and that we have no guarantee that he won't ever do this again. So our best option is just to try and give him some kind of counseling or help in hopes that he won't revert back to this bad behavior. And so at 13 years old, uh, Charlie was committed to a state psychiatric hospital for a year. In that time, his father spent a lot of effort in trying to regain custody of Charlie. And in fact, by the end of the a little bit over a year time, he did manage to get Charlie back. But the thing was, is I think Herbert was very in like-mindedness with a lot of other people of his time. Heading back to Brenda again, you know, her father was told multiple times that she needed psychiatric help, that she was showing signs and symptoms, that she wasn't doing all right, and she needed to deal with it. She needed to talk to someone, and he refused her that. In a very similar air, Herbert took back control of Charlie and then proceeded to do nothing other than the fact that he collected his entire family up and they moved to Florida. They got the hell out of Dodge as if they were running from a hurricane, but they were just running from their past. And according to Angela, nothing was ever brought up about this again. Like this was just a deep, dark family secret that they just weren't supposed to talk about. And she says that Herbert never, 
ever talk to Charlie about the events of that night. He never even asked him, like, Charlie, why? Or, Charlie, what happened? Like, instead, he just took his kid back into his house and tried to forget the whole thing. Herbert got remarried within two years. And, in fact, the two younger daughters, they were never even told how their mother actually died. They'd been so young that they didn't really remember the events. So the entire family just lied to them and told them a lie about why their mother was dead. So as far as Angela was concerned, this was just something that was never spoken of, never talked about. And the police needed to know this wasn't the first time Charlie snapped and murdered. He'd done it before. This totally blew people away. This had not been the story that people were expecting his sister to come out with. And um, it really only left more questions. So Charlie was already a murderer. Did Terry know? Like, how could, and according to Terry's family, there's no freaking way she could have known any of this. You know, according to them, if Terry had known anything like this about Charlie, she never would have married him 17 years ago, yet alone been together this long. She, there would have been signs. Like, Terry must not have known, according to them. But Angela's ex-husband, who would be Terry's brother-in-law, said he didn't think Terry was that innocent. Essentially, he said, no, Terry knew, well, at least something. He says, I knew, because at one point after marrying Angela, I came home and she was crying and she told me the story of how her mother died and that she was very upset, but that, you know, it's it's the past and that was gone and, and that it was something they didn't talk about. And he said that even Charlie kind of expressed what had happened to him and that he had had a couple of weird conversations with Charlie before. But, you know, he'd been buddies in the 80s and they had hung out. And he did say that when Charlie met Terry, that the brother-in-law said he had tried to tell Charlie that he needed to let Terry know about his past before allowing themselves to get married. And Charlie said, yeah, yeah, I will. So according to a brother-in-law, she knew... Mm, something? I mean, there's no guarantee that Charlie ever told her the truth or said anything to the likes of, I'm a murderer. For all we know, Charlie could have been like, hey, when I was a kid, I was, you know, a bad kid with a temper or a shoplifter or, you know, a lot of people tell you stories like, hey, when I was a kid, I was a little shit, you know, I or I have this kind of health issue. You know, something alike to that, that case. And the only reason that the brother-in-law really ever thought that this was likely was maybe at one point they talked about, hey, Terry, you and Charlie ever going to have kids? And, you know, Terry said something to the likes of, no, probably not, you know, considering Charlie's past. But again, that, that really just means nothing. It really means that he said something about me is not positive from the past I mean it really has no indication that he would have told her necessarily the truth so like we said now we know Charlie's a murderer now we maybe know Terry might have knew something but beyond that like we're looking at no answers we're, friends thought they were coming home people had met them up this weekend so why the snap so police felt like the only place they were going to start getting answers was if they went back to Charlie and Terry's house back in Big Pine Key. And uh, answers they definitely got. So when they got down there, they found the house all boarded up like they'd left it for the hurricane. And inside was basically just as pristine as Michelle's. Like, Charlie had been an engineer, and he was very exact about how he liked things. And as police started to dig through their home, strange things started to pop up. You know, they've definitely found Terry's journals, and they went through every single page of that, hoping there would be some kind of hint to the fact that, you know, things were going wrong or Charlie had been acting weird. But what they really found was a very humdrum, normal life. Hey, go get groceries, spent the day fishing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing odd at all. Where they started to find the odd things was in Charlie's bedroom. On the back of Charlie's bedroom door was a female anatomy poster. So it's like one of those posters you would see in like a biology class or in nursing school. Essentially, it's a naked form of a female, you know, with her hands out so that the whole body is exposed. And then on one side, it's normal. And then on this particular poster on the left side, there's just little portions of the body that have been removed by different layers so that you would understand like if 
if you didn't see the skin here, below this would be this muscle. Or beyond that would be this tendon. Or, you know, here's, you know, where a leg bone would be. Like, it's one of those where there's just little odd sections that have been taken out so you can understand the underlying biology. But the thing was, is Charlie's in his late 40s. And he's an engineer. He's not a medical professional. Nor is Terry. This is just a very, this strikes police as a very odd item to have kept in the house. Yet alone... When we discuss what it was that Charlie had done to Michelle, police couldn't help but be reminded that this looked very similar. Michelle's left leg had been removed. This body only had, you know, removal on the left side in the poster. To go even further, the more they searched the house, more medical items started popping up. There were medical books. There were journals. And there even was an anatomy book. And inside the anatomy book, there was a newspaper clipping with a picture of a human heart. You know, the same way that he removed her human heart from her chest. So this, these were things he'd been idolizing. He'd been dreaming about. He'd been reading about it, thinking about it, planning it. It looked a lot more like this wasn't just a total snap. This has been, this was a fantasy for Charlie. Then, of course, where else are you going to find a man's fantasies than on his computer? And once they turned to that, they were in for a whole new world of gross. In Charlie's search history, it displayed the fact that he liked to frequent a lot of websites that hinted at the things that he'd been planning for Michelle. He liked to look at websites that enjoyed discussing death fantasies. He also went to websites that were very pro-violence against women, so some very early incel shit. He enjoyed going to necrophilia sites. He often looked over autopsy sites. And according to one detective, he might have even frequented a site called Necrobabes. And like I said, police just, they started putting two and two together. The, this was the real Charlie. And despite the fact that everyone was coming forward and saying like, no, Charlie's quiet. No, he's, he's just like a cool, quiet dude that you can always rely on. If you need something, you call Charlie. In reality, Charlie was sitting at home fapping off to the idea of murdering women and looking in anatomy books to see what the insides of people were like. And, and that was a fantasy for him. And to top it off, when you go back to the fact that he always called Michelle, you know, Victoria's Secrets, he had spread all this underwear around her room. Then they find a Victoria's Secret catalog subscription, not to Terry, but to Charlie. You know, so it kind of starts all adding up. These, these were his fantasies. And then on top of it, he was just unloading it onto this beautiful woman that was untouchable for him, his niece, his wife's niece. He could not do anything with her. And yet they kept getting so close all the time. We hang out once or twice a year. Like, I'm sure she came down to the Keys to visit. So maybe it was just too much. But the problem was, is maybe it wasn't just too much. Maybe it wasn't that his infatuation with Michelle was the only thing that was encompassing his whole life. Like, we've known the fact that now Charlie has murdered. He murdered more than 30 years ago at that point in time. And it just seemed that when they looked at the body of Michelle, the precision, the surgical likeness of it, The fact that he'd been planning it out at home has no reason why what he did to her would have been so clean. You can think about painting a painting all the days of your life, but put a canvas out and try and put the same work onto a canvas and get the same clean lines. That's not how life works, kiddo. The fact is, is it seemed to police like he'd been pretty well practiced. And so lead investigator Rob Himmert, he began to look into possible crimes that could be related to Charlie. He was starting to get the sense that this wasn't just like a psycho that snapped twice. This was a psycho that was a literal serial killer. And in the end, from FBI case files, they uncovered 26 cases that seemed really familiar to Charlie's M.O. Out of those 26 cases, at least two of them seem likely to be connected to Charlie, that he murdered two other women at the very least. And that would be the 1989 murder of Sherry Parisho and the 1995 murder of Darlene Toller. What police found was in 1989, 
uh, Sherry Parisho uh, was not living her best life at that portion in time. She had been a high school beauty queen from Illinois, but that had been a long time ago. And in 1989, she was 39 and living down in the Florida Keys, more like a transient lifestyle or what a lot more people would just admit to the fact that she was homeless. People knew her. She was kind of a, a eccentric hippie woman. They remember her riding around on her bike a lot, taking up rays in her blue little bikini. And the fact that she believed in magic and she also believed in the idea that she could control rain, you know, eccentric or whatever you want to call it. Sherry was just living her life down in the Keys. And at that time, besides that she owned a bike, she also owned a little green dinghy. It had her name on the back of it. And that's where she lived. She would often take her bike out to her boat and then she would row the boat out into the water about 100 meters, drop anchor, and that's where she would sleep. You know, there's worse options, I guess. It's just not the safest thing for a woman to be doing is literally sleeping in a boat sometimes underneath bridges or out in the open water um, in a dinghy. And when I say a dinghy, we're talking like a, a five to eight foot boat. We're not talking boat boat. We're talking about the little toot toot you get from a boat to the land. Either way, that's that was Sherry's life. And then around 10 p.m. on July 19th, uh, Taurus got the shock of his fucking life. He had been hanging out fishing over Pine Channel Bridge and he hooked something. What he hoped was a really big fucking fish. Turned out what he had actually hooked was Sherry's left elbow. Police were obviously called, and what they discovered was that Sherry had been drowned. She'd then been thrown to the bottom of her dinghy, where someone had slit her throat to the point where she was nearly decapitated, and then they cut her chest open and pulled out her heart, and it was missing. This very much sounds like the M.O. of the person that did this to Michelle, doesn't it? Problem is, at this point in time, there were really there were no leads. You have a fisherman who found a body in a boat, and you have one person who recalled a sketchy figure that had been close to the scene who had been running across the highway. Which, just for a little definition of the Florida Keys, there's like one highway. That's the road. Everybody travels that road, and that's the road that has all the bridges on it. So if you're trying to fish off a bridge or near a bridge, you park on either side of this highway, and you get out and you go down to the water. And if you're trying to cross that highway, like I say highway, it's usually two lanes to four lanes, probably at this time mostly two lane, you just hustle. The point is, is it's dark, it's 10 o'clock at night, there's not a lot of lights out on this highway, and someone saw a dark figure running across the road, and that was it. But, like I said, the MO, as far as this case goes, is very similar to what had happened to Michelle. And not only that, but the fact is, is this murder literally happened a thousand meters away from Charlie's house at the time. And according to the ex-brother-in-law, this was a night that he and Terry talked about. He said that after the murder, Terry came to him and said something funny like, Hey, you remember that murder that happened near my house a little while ago? And the ex-brother-in-law is like, well, yeah, obviously. And Terry says, well, I'm thinking about going to the sheriffs and talking to them. And the brother-in-law is like, well, what would make you think that or want to do that? Like, what would you have to say to them? And Terry goes on to say, well, it's strange because that night uh, I found Charlie and he was soaking wet and he had blood on him. And I asked him what was going on and he just simply said he'd been out fishing and that he'd been filleting fish and got blood all over him. And it kind of stuck with her. And again, she said, well, you know, Charlie has a past. Nothing deeper than that. Just, you know, Charlie has a past. But in the end... She never did go to the sheriff's department. She never wrote anything in her diary to expound on her her thoughts or ideas on this. She really just tried to keep it to herself, which isn't even what her brother-in-law did. Her brother-in-law, for some unknown reason, went to Charlie and amidst the fact that Charlie's wife was thinking about talking to the sheriff. So Narky Nark and the Snitchy Bunch, evidently, wanted to literally put a woman's life in danger because he felt the need to tell a former murderer 
that his wife was thinking about talking to cops. And luckily for Terry at the time, you know, Charlie just simply looked at his brother-in-law and just said, well, I didn't do it and left it at that. So, you know, that's how like there that murder went no further. As far as police were concerned, this was terrible and awful, but it's just some transient woman in an area that has a high level of just people traveling back and forth on vacation. This couldn't might not even be a local and it went to a cold case. At this point in time, it has now been closed. They do believe that Charlie did this. And that wasn't the only one that they're pretty sure on. The other case happened to be in 1995 for the murder of Darlene Toller. She'd been living in Miami. She'd been working as a prostitute. And on Thanksgiving in 1995, the last time anyone saw her was her leaving Little Havana. The next day, her body was found in a plastic bag by the side of the road as if the person didn't give a shit about the police finding the body. They just wanted it found. The things that they didn't find with that body was a head or a heart. The problem was, is when I found the article on this death from 1995, she warranted less than two paragraphs of explanation for what had happened to her. Police essentially said that they were gifted a a essential bag of a body and nothing else. And the fact is, is again, just like it being a transient, this woman had been working as a prostitute. And so it didn't, it didn't seem to go that much deeper. Again, this is, this is freaking 1995 in, in Miami. We're talking probably lots of drugs, lots of prostitutes, and lots of murders happening. But when we talk about lots, the thing that should have really been sticking out was the fact that that year, 11 more prostitutes were murdered in a very similar manner. So as far as the Miami police knew, they really did have a serial killer on their hands. And it might not just have been Charlie, but either way, not only did they not put the information out there as much as they should have to keep the case going, but um, it pretty much also went completely cold. Now, although I saw a lot of reports that were trying to connect this to Charlie, I can't say that it's been closed because I never actually saw anything stating that it was. And in fact, I've also seen it possibly linked to another murderer up in Boston. And it's also in 2013 was supposed to be testing like dog hair that had been found on the body. So they were still doing DNA tests and they still couldn't guarantee that Charlie had committed this murder. The only thing that really connected him to it was, again, the MO, the missing head, the missing heart. But also the fact that Charlie, being the brilliant idiot that he is, also kept like really distinct records uh, for everything, receipts, bills. But he also always wrote down his mileage and the gas. So whenever he got a tank of gas, he'd write down how much gas he got, how much it cost, and what the mileage was at that time. And then you can be guaranteed when he drove 200 miles somewhere else, he'd write it down again. His mileage for that day pretty much put him in the area for murdering Darlene. Like, he could have very at least been in this area. And it just just very well seems like something he would have done, considering this seems to be his habit. But that's it. You know, Charlie, we don't know how many people Charlie has murdered or what he's done. He lived a fairly quiet life, mostly out of the internet age. So what really has us, like, confirmed to the fact that he's a freaking psycho beyond the murders he committed is his search history. But the thing is, is police say that Charlie, from 1972, so once his father moved him to Florida, all the way into the point where he's married and beyond to Terry, Charlie traveled extensively, traveled extensively throughout Florida, which could be a 12-plus hour drive, He's traveled throughout the United States, and he's even traveled outside of the United States. Police confiscated his passport. A guy who legally we knew. Like, I mean, it wasn't just that it was a secret. I mean, his family kept it quiet, but this guy is a murderer. It should have been on his record. This guy should not have been able to get a passport, but he had. And so a lot of police are just convinced. Like, you don't just brutally murder someone and then wait 30 years, and then brutally murder two more people. Especially when you have clearly destructive fantasies at home. 
this is just not the habit of a serial killer. And police are just, they're pretty positive that that's exactly what Charlie is, that he has been spending 30 plus years traveling the United States and murdering women. And in fact, the main detective that still works these cases, he says that there's not a week that doesn't go by where he doesn't receive a phone call from some police department somewhere in the United States who has a cold case. And now they're just so happening to wonder, could Charlie have done it? And that's the thing. Like Right now, you guys could probably help out on solving a lot of cold cases. And police do have the responsibility and are trying to close them. On if you ever have this inkling, a memory, something that happened years ago that's just always stuck with you because it was odd and didn't you always kind of wonder, well, it doesn't hurt to try and give a call to Crime Stoppers. You can call them at 1-866-471-TIPS. It's all anonymous. Or if that's too much, which honestly, any phone call for me is too much. I just don't want to, so no. You can literally just go on Crime Stopper's website and leave an anonymous tip there too. And it, it's not going to come back to you. It's fine. Charlie is dead. For a lot of these cases, something that you probably remember is just seeming really odd enough for you to remember 20 years down the road it might be time to let someone know and let them just do a little research back into it. You never know what comfort or case you could help close. And, and you know, honestly, we all kind of owe it to the women like Darlene or Sherry. They didn't do anything wrong. And because the lives they were living, you know, someone took advantage of that and murdered them. And then someone else took advantage of that and didn't complete their search on trying to find them justice. And we can still do that. We can, and I believe in you guys. Not me, I know nothing, but some of you might. <laughs> and that's really, that's going to be my story for this week. That's, I guess I was a little too wrapped up in the hurricane theme, and then a hurricane came, and then, yeah, I just wanted to, you know, make sure that if you weren't scared enough by, you know, all the potential horrific things that could happen to you during a storm, just want to remind you, like, hey, hey, maybe you're sitting there right now with your windows boarded up. And, and where is your uncle? Where did he disappear to? Huh? Well, anyways, that's going to be it for me this week. <laughs> I am so happy that this is done because next week we're definitely getting Corey back and... I can't wait to hang out and actually have someone to actually talk to. And until then, if you guys want to do us any favors, you can always write me a message and let me know how I did. Or if you really want to do the show a favor, please go on whatever listening app that you use and just hit subscribe. You don't even got to leave a message or anything like that. No extra work. Just click a button. It's right there. Right, right over, right below that. Yeah, right there below the image. Okay, cool, guys. Well, I hope everyone stayed safe during this hurricane, and I hope that everyone's doing good no matter where they are right now. Thanks for coming in and giving us a listen, and we'll see you next week. Bye. <laughs>